hello everybody. Um, good afternoon and uh, a very warm welcome to today's webinar, um, which is hybrid working, the new normal for SMEs. Um, for those of you who are new to us, uh, you may not know that we do run an ongoing um, programme of webinars covering a very wide variety of topics uh, relating to HR and business. Uh, my name is Cliff Houston. I'm Marketing Manager here at My HR Toolkit and uh, I'm your host today. Um, what we'll be having, just to give you a quick summary, is uh, a presentation which will last a approximately 30 minutes, um, following which there'll be some time uh, for you to ask your questions and our guest speaker today will uh, will be addressing those. Um, in your Zoom, you will see that uh, there's a couple of options. Um, you've got the regular chat, which is good for just popping little messages backwards and forwards. But if you have um, any specific questions that you want uh, to pop in onto the list for our speaker today, then please do put those specifically in the Q&A um, section that you will see in your Zoom menu. Um, little bit of housekeeping just to clarify as always today's session is offering general not legal advice uh, and is based on information available as of today. Um, you may also be interested to know that our next webinar coming up in a couple of weeks on the 24th of March is on how to handle employee grievances. Uh, we'll be popping a link into the chat for you uh, if you'd like to get registered for that and also the email that we send you following up from this webinar will have um, a registration link for you on that. Uh, so our special guest speaker this morning um, talking to us about hybrid working and whether this is the new normal for SMEs is uh, Gemma Dale. Gemma is an HR director herself, um, an expert on flexible working and also is uh, a regular contributor to our own blog at My HR Toolkit. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Gemma now um, to deliver her presentation this morning this evening, afternoon, even this afternoon. <laughs> it's working from home, Cliff. It confuses <laughs> all of us. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, and um, thank you very much, my HR Toolkit, um, for uh, inviting me to come and talk to you uh, this afternoon. Um, if you just bear with me for a second, um, Cliff will just be um, turning off the holding slide and my slides will be coming up in a moment. Um, just uh, let us get that organised and I'm going to take you through some practical thoughts today um, on hybrid working. Um, this is quite timely I think because um, it's for many of us now we'll be approaching the anniversary of um, you know a lot of our offices closing and us going to work from home. Um, before the pandemic, about 7% of the UK workforce worked regularly from home. The CIPD had described the uh, pace of change towards flexible working prior to that as glacial. And then we have these requirements to work from home. And across Europe, we uh, estimate that 100 million people went to work from home and more than half of them had never worked from home before. So, um, of course, when we went to work from home initially, uh, we thought maybe it was for a couple of months. I know I did. I took enough things from my office uh, thinking two, maybe three months. And, and here we are. I'm talking to you again from my living room. I guess many of you are in similar situations. I do think that had the pandemic been much more short lived, had it really been just weeks or months, maybe we wouldn't be having this conversation right now. But hybrid is all everybody's talking about. So what I want to do today is start by thinking and talking through what are the things, what are the practical steps that we need to think about if we want a more flexible future and a more hybrid future. But before, let's just start with these headlines. These, I'm sure, have become familiar to you. People started doing these surveys. I did my own survey uh, in about May and June last year. We started to see these surveys, these coming through that even in the midst of the complexity, the anxiety of living and working through a global pandemic, even when we we're homeschooling and caring responsibilities, we still found huge benefits around working from home. And there's something really interesting in that. I used to say often when I was talking about flexible working before the pandemic, um, I used to often say about the way that we commuted all at the same time to go into a physical office to do mostly virtual work with stuff that we carried there in, in laptop bags. 
I used to say that if we invented work tomorrow, we wouldn't invent this. And I do believe that there is something in our desire to hold on to an element of homeworking, an element of hybrid working, which is really around people rethinking what they want out of life and rethinking ideas around work-life balance, around meaning and purpose. There are lots of reasons why people have enjoyed or appreciated working from home. People have talked to me about more time with friends, family, children, more time for exercise, better cooking, uh, but of course, freedom from the commute, which for many people is long and expensive. So we know that this desire is here. The question is, how do we respond? The risks, of course, if we do not, given the number of organisations that are coming out there and saying we are going to embrace hybrid, we run the risk of losing our talent. The response to hybrid is really varied. I'm sure some of you have seen the other headlines as well. BT came out this week and said all staff 40% of their time from home now. I've heard of big companies with huge office spaces in the City of London talking about um, halving their, uh, their office space, reducing costs. I did see a headline a few weeks ago from an organisation that said working from home is an aberration and we must all get back to the office. The truth is in the old days, which is how I've really inappropriately started to refer to this time last year, but in the old days, we did the office. We know how to do the office. We've done it since the end of the Industrial Revolution, whether it worked or whether it didn't. We then moved, not by choice, but by necessity, to remote for about half of the workforce. Um, the question is then what sits in between these two extremes, these two ends of a spectrum. What does hybrid mean? I debated how to actually set out this slide because in some respects it's not what sits in the middle, it's what sits next. And we can think of this maybe as a three-stage evolution. We did office, we've done and continue to do home and we'll do for a little while. The question is what comes next? What is going to come next is going to be slightly complicated by the fact that while social distancing remains something we need to adhere to, whilst the vaccine uh, is rolled out and the virus is still in circulation, we're going to inevitably have some sort of hybrid. At the moment, the government is suggesting that the um, uh, work from home recommendation will end on the 21st of June. That may, of course, shift or change. If it doesn't change, those are the dates when people may start to think about returning to the office. Um, but of course, we're not all going to do it en masse, we're not all going to pack into buses and trains uh, and tubes on that day and all go back. We will have some sort of hybrid approach. So this is why I think it's imperative that organisations start thinking about that now, as well as those longer term needs and strategies. Of course, we have got to figure out how to do hybrid. There are lots of organisations that have done very, very successfully 100% remote working but hybrid is still emerging, it's new, there are few precedents. So we're all going to be learning as we go. That could mean that that first return, that phased piece is gonna be messy and we need to prepare for that. There is a real risk in my view that that period of time could potentially derail longer term ambitions around flexible and hybrid working because if that bit goes wrong, those people that don't like it and there are still lots of people that don't want flex. Uh, that's their justification. So those are some of the things I'm going to talk about today. But the one thing that I do mention is the absolute necessity of people figuring out what hybrid means to them and their organisation specifically. There is no one single form of hybrid. And, and even within one organisation, um, it may be not possible to have one form of hybrid because we will have scenarios where some roles can be hybrid, some roles can have no remote working at all, and with other people, or frankly on the job that they do, if they only came in once a month, it wouldn't matter. And we're likely to have those hybrid spectrums even within one organisation. I genuinely don't believe that it's possible to say we're not going to do any form of, of home working, any form of hybrid working, unless we want to take risks around talent acquisition and retention. 
but we all will, each of us, need to think about how flexible is our flexible approach going to be? You can have hybrid. How much autonomy will they have within that? Does hybrid mean they can work on a Friday occasionally from home? Or does it mean they have that complete autonomy to get up in the morning and think, should I go in the office today? No, I think I'll stay at home. Where are you going to lie on that spectrum is a key piece of work. It will be in the office when, how will that be decided and managed? And what schedules do we still need to keep? There's another big question for me. And that is, after COVID, what is your office for? In the pre-COVID world, we would go into our offices regardless. It was our default position. Even if that meant for lots of us, it's certainly true of my office, that we would go into the office and I would send lots of emails and, and that didn't necessarily mean I was collaborating or connecting. If, if this time has taught us anything, it is that we can do a lot of the work from different places. We don't need to actually do that thing about being in the same place at the same time. So therefore, what are offices for? How do we repurpose them and redesign them? What do our employees want from being in the office? I think there's a real possibility that in the longer term, we, people will start redesigning offices. We may also see the rise of kind of third spaces. So organisations having smaller hubs or encouraging people to use co-working spaces closer to their home, maybe meeting colleagues there. So I think longer term, we may well see the office and, and what it looks like shift and change. But in the interim, especially when people want that reconnection that we've lost for a year in those early days, thinking about whether our spaces provide the right uh, space, the right encouragement, the right facilitation for effective collaboration and relationship building. Um, so how do we build that colleague interaction in uh, and repurpose the office? These are big questions for me that are not truly answerable at this moment and not everybody will necessarily have the budget to do in the short term. And of course, there are different approaches potentially depending on whether we're talking about this enforced hybrid whilst the um, pandemic is still ongoing and, and the virus is still a risk to us. And then the longer term future when hopefully COVID um, is no longer such a threat uh, to our situations. So I'm going to come on to some practical stuff now. Those are my kind of big question items. Now some practical things around if you're thinking hybrid, what do you actually need to be planning for? What are the steps? towards a hybrid working environment. So I'm going to start with practicalities. Lots of people during the pandemic have worked in not great situations. They've worked in dining chairs, they've worked from sofas, um, and that is not sustainable in the longer term. Um, I'm talking to you today from an IKEA dining chair um, and I'm going to be honest with you, I, I'm kind of over it. But these are the things that if you had gone to remote as a strategy, you would have sorted out. No one could have done it with the notice that we had, but we do need to think about it now. We need to think about whether people have got the right ergonomics. Do they have workstations that are you know, compliant with health and safety, with, you know, with things like light? Do they have storage? We need to think about some of those practicalities. We're going to probably need policies as well. That may be revisiting flexible working or home working policies. It may be creating new ones, but there are other policies as well that are relevant. Data protection, health and safety, expenses, IT use, and so on. Some of these I'm going to pick up uh, later in the presentation, but there are questions to be asked. Are you going to fund people to have equipment in their own homes? Lots of companies I'm talking to saying no to that, by the way, because hybrid's a choice for them and there'll still be a desk in the office. Are you going to contribute to people's expenses if they're working from home? Um, and again, these things are personal choices, but will need to be worked through and communicated. I'm going to pick up more of these as we go through. Let me talk about policies. Um, hybrid. Is it formal or informal? Do you want people to make a flexible working request and go through that process? Or is this something that you're just going to allow managers to sort out directly with their employees? The answer to this will be different from each of you. Um, and to some extent, it depends on the maturity of your culture and the kinds of roles that you have. What's different now about hybrid and the old flexible working, if I may be allowed to call it that, is that many other forms of flex, part time work, job shares, compressed hours, annualised hours, they're quite individual and it's possible to make an individual request. Hybrid, however, really just needs to be thought about more holistically. 
if you've got a team of 20 people, your line manager does not want 20 separate flexible working requests. You need to look at it um, in, in a much broader way. And we're going to need to train managers how to do that. Yes, that includes what's the law around flexible working and what does the law say about how you consider requests and how you turn one down. But more fundamentally, how do you consider a whole team going hybrid? And then if you've got these big policies, how do we bring them to life at that team level? One of the best ways I can recommend teams do this is that organisations set the direction and teams are allowed to craft this for themselves. They need support and guidance on how to do that. But when teams figure it out, are we having a rota or can I choose myself? What comms uh, methods are we going to use? Are we using Teams or are we using Zoom? Giving people those powers to figure that stuff out really works in my experience. But we're going to need help for managers. We're going to need toolkits and we're going to need to help people be successful hybrid workers because once again, hybrid is different to office and it is very different to remote and how we spent the last 12 months. So what else? back up again to some big picture stuff. We're gonna to have to really rethink some of the stuff we do in offices, how we work, how we communicate, um, what time we work. There's no reason why we have to work nine to five. Um, it's kind of a tradition. It's what I call the default working model. It rises from the days when there wasn't any tech and we all had to come in and work at the same time because if we we're gonna build a car, we all had to be there to build the car. Technology has given us the potential to be free from that because we can work synchronously, i.e. together in a meeting together or in an online space together, or we can work asynchronously. We can work um, by uploading documents and commenting on them, by contributing to social media chats and all these other things at a different time. So we have to rethink some of this stuff. But as I've already said, we've also got to help people be good at it. We've got to help managers be good at managing a hybrid team. and We've got to help uh, in employees to be successful at this too. Again, normally when you go remote, you train people, you help them with things like work-life balance, with the practicalities, with how to set a desk up, with how to manage their time whilst working remotely. We didn't do any of that. It still needs to be done, in my opinion. Comms then. This is a really high risk area. If there's a place that this is going to go wrong, it's in who's got the information and when they've got the information. And this is another area where I think teams need to come together and go, how are we going to do this with support and facilitation? The importance of face-to-face -face communication, I think, still remains and people do want that. The problems will begin when we've got some people in the office and some people out. Now, in this kind of interim forced hybrid state that we're likely to come back to as into the summer and into the autumn, we may have even another complexity where some people can come back all the time and some people have to carry on working from home all of the time. Maybe they still need to shield, depends on what the government guidance is at that time. Maybe they're caring for somebody. They could have long COVID and you know, that is becoming increasingly something we need to look at and make adjustments for. Maybe wraparound care isn't back. Maybe people are still waiting for vaccines. We don't know what, where we'll be with some of that stuff. So um, we're gonna have to think that through. But one of the things that we do know is that if you have a meeting in a physical space with some people remote, it doesn't work. If you've ever been dialed in by, a, um, by phone to a meeting where everybody else is in the room, you know what I mean. The, the official term for that is called presence disparity. So some people who um, they're on the end of the phone, they're having a completely different experience of that meeting to everybody else. So the advice will always be default to online. Even if you're five people out of 10 are in the office, they don't go and get in a room and then dial somebody else in. Everybody is on Zoom or Teams or whatever it is they're doing. Have to focus on bringing home workers into the conversation. Um, but we also, at the same time, have to balance this with things like Zoom fatigue. I'll talk about that more in a moment. But I think if there's one real criticism I've got of lots of organisations right now, is that when we went to work from home, we lifted and shifted what we used to do from our offices into our homes. Because if we had a face-to-face -face meeting, we now have a Zoom. We do really need to rethink this. We need to be much more nuanced about it and think, do you know what, this kind of comms, we need to see each other and this is a Zoom. But this, this can be a Slack update. This can be a Teams update. This can be a post on our internal social media network. So we need to think that through. This is again, one of those things that really needs to be looked at on a team by team basis. What do we need to communicate when? 
who's going to be in the office? Are we sharing calendars? Are we going to use the little presence dot telling me whether I'm in or out on Microsoft Teams? Um, you know, what, what does this mean for us? Are we going to have some core days that we all come in and we're going to have some core days and core hours? A whole range of different things. What will work will depend entirely on the context. Um, so again, something for each team to work through themselves. And on to this technology again. Hybrid working is only viable with good tech. And that tech, it's less about the specific platform, but how well people can use it. It also needs to be completely seamless. There needs to be complete ease of connectivity between people in the office and people at home. And it also needs to be smooth. So I'm just as effective when I'm on a premises, on a, on a work premises, as I am at home. Same login type systems and all of that sort of thing. We, we need to ensure that we've got that ease of use. So it's less about, you know, I prefer Zoom over Teams, but that's just kind of personal preference stuff. The other thing we need to think about is the people that are really still struggling to use it. And it'd be really easy to say, well, we've been doing this for, you know, everybody's learned how to Zoom. Do you know what? They haven't. And some people, they've, they've figured out the basics, but they can't go to the next level. They haven't learned to go to the next level. So I, I believe that some of the things we need to do around tech include things like having some defined channels. So we're only going to use Teams or we're only going to use Slack. Trying to discourage people from setting up their own additional channels, because what we then end up with is kind of notification overload. Um, so if somebody goes, yeah, let's have a team WhatsApp group, then the answer is, well, let's just think about that for a second because we've already got something else. So kind of managing that well is really important, um, but it needs to include asynchronous tools. So not just having a Zoom for everything, because as we know, people are worn out by Zoom. Some really interesting research last week came out from Stanford University on this and why um, Zoom is just so tiring. Um, uh, if anybody wants to connect with me on LinkedIn, scroll back on my profile, you'll find uh, I, I shared it there. Um, but, you know, this idea of just looking at yourself all the time has a cognitive load, um, especially when the hairdressers have been shot for a while. Um, so lots to think about in terms of tech, but still making sure that people have got the skills um, to use it well and the tech fits the particular dynamic. And then we come on to um, something that's also really important, and that's performance management. Many of us have a huge tendency to conflate presence and performance. I can see you, therefore you're doing good work. We all know that's a myth. Micromanagement was a big part of our organisations. It's a big part of the office. It has been since the days of Frederick Winslow Taylor. Um, and if you're in HR on the course day, you'll remember him from your HR training. He's the guy that basically invented measuring what people did at work. Um, people have spent a, quite a bit of time in this last year inventing all sorts of new tools and ways to monitor people remotely. We all know that, you know, you can get around any of those things if you want to. There are tools where you, somebody will check how many times you're pressing your keys on your keyboard if you really want to go and buy them. But truthfully, what we need to be doing is moving away from that and moving to judging people on their outcomes and their value contribution. If you don't know what a row is, that's a new term to you. It stands for results only working environment. It's a methodology. I'm going to recommend you a book. It's called Work Sucks and How to Fix It. That's about results only working environments. It's much more radical than hybrid, but the principle means we are judging people not on their face time, but on what they deliver to the organisation. Objectives, goals, we're still going to be in quite a changing environment for a while. We need to make sure that they are up to date um, and recognise the shifting cr uh, criteria. We also need to recognise that for a lot of people the last year, they have not been able to perform as well as they would have liked to have done in the playing field is uneven. But, you know, performance management in a hybrid environment means you can't rely on judging somebody. But it's also a space where bias might creep in because we have to challenge that. Are we going to end up kind of defaulting to the people that we can see? Ah, you know, so-and-so, they're a good egg because they're always in the office. So they're the people that get rewarded, promoted, etc. So that's something we really need to guard for. We need to think about the inclusion aspects of um, performance management. But this is going to be a new skill 
this is going to be a very much a new skill but some of the stuff that worked in the old days is just as valid timely feedback good objectives regular conversations looking forward and back we just need to update it for a scenario in which we can't automatically see people a few more things before questions connecting then this is a little bit similar to the point I made around the office, which is we really need to think about what we come into the office for. We know we don't need to come into the office to do um, uh, emails and things like that, because we know now we've learned that we can do them from home. I would imagine that for lots of organisations this time last year, you had a big old list of jobs that could not possibly be done remotely. And yes, here we are running whole organisations from our living rooms. This is not about recreating the water cooler conversation, which I've heard talked about a lot. And about you, I've never had a good conversation about a water cooler. I'm normally just kind of thinking, will you hurry up so I can get my water? Um, it's not that. It's not necessarily about that. It's, it's about making the most of the time when people are together and in the office and, and, and not just bringing people together to do work that they could do at home. It's also helping people to think through when do I need to be in and, and what's the most useful time for me to do that? You know, place has pivoted and, and now we need to pivot some of these other things along the way. I've touched on managers already, but I want to come back to this now. Hybrid brings all sorts of new dynamics. We know that in the past, lots of people didn't get the flexible working that they wanted. There were barriers to it and managers were one of those barriers. Unfortunately, when people make decisions around flexible working, they sometimes overlay their own views, their own biases and their own personal preferences. There's pre-pandemic research that suggests that um, around a third of managers would describe people in the past who work flexibly as less committed and motivated. Um, there's what we call the flexibility stigma associated with some forms of flexible working. I'd like to think that this time is going to change all of that and we'll come in with new attitudes, but you know, this stuff is pretty hardwired. So we do need to manage our own biases around this stuff. Um, and we are going to have to make sure that some of those managers who really would like to recreate the old days of micromanagement, you know, we, we're going to find ways to challenge that. We need to help managers make this shift. So yes, tackling conflict if it arises between people who are in the office and people who aren't, or maybe there are teams where people can have hybrid and some people can't. We have to work that stuff through. We're going to have to get them to think about how they assess people's contributions, how they communicate with their team and how they lead in this whole new way. And also some practical things around how do they kind of schedule and work out who's going to be in and when. There's a lot to do for managers. And it also includes some of those things I've talked about, like bits of practical law and policy information on how do they decide um, whether somebody can have, um, you know, a, a particular form of flexible working or not. So things that we do need to think about, and I'm going back up now into the bigger picture stuff is culture. Many of our organisation cultures were driven by presenteers and they were driven by meetings and hybrid gives us the opportunity to change that. But those cultures are very often hardwired and strong and there's a potential they're going to pull us right back in when we're allowed to go back to the office. We have to fundamentally challenge some of our beliefs about work, where it is done, what's good work, what's a good employee. Uh, some of those things that, you know, are, are very much, as I've said, hardwired into us have to challenge our own attitudes and those of others. And that includes things like inclusion and levelling the playing field between those who are in and those who are out. It also means getting rid of those jokes around, are you just a part timer or are you clocking off early or, you know, what time do you call this? It's all of those things. Um, so there's a great deal of work to do. I pop new starters in there as well, because we also have to think about people who are new to our organisation and how do we bring them in? My final point, I've dedicated a whole slide to this. We have to stop rewarding presenteeism. We have to start glorifying being busy and rewarding people for time served and defaulting to the people that we can see. And we have to try somehow to get rid of these biases against people who work flexibly. So there's a question to be asked. Who do we reward and recognise? Who do we promote? 
who do we give learning and development to and who do we give those you know the best projects to and everything else and is it people we can see or is it people that perform and how are we objectively judging that performance for hr teams or business leaders here today here's my recommendations the practical steps First of all, if you haven't done this already, do a listening exercise. Talk to your people, a focus group, a survey, whatever it is, and ask them a few questions. What's worked for you during this time? What hasn't? What do you want to keep? What do you want to give up? Then start thinking about your particular definition of hybrid and what that might look like. I've written a couple of blogs on some of this stuff. If you um, want to find my blog online, you're welcome to do so. Um, look me up on Twitter and you'll find the link, but there's some more information in there. But you may need to think about sort of categories of homeworking. So for example, I touched on this earlier, people who can have complete remote, people who will need to be in the office completely, people that can have 50-50, people that can have the occasional day. It's a good way of sense making it for people. Um, and it's likely you're going to need more than one category. Uh, lots of organisations certainly will. You need to engage managers on the journey. Some of them will not want to do this. Some people will be scared by it. Some people will feel it's going to challenge their, uh, their authority. Uh, some people want everybody back to the office. So we're going to have to take them with us on this journey. We also need to look at every single bit of that employee life cycle. How do we recruit people that are going to work flexibly, induct them? How do we think about the learning and development that we provide in this scenario? when people are in and people are out. And then we need to develop the skills, both within our people managers and beyond. And I have two final summary points. One is we need to resolve to experiment. As I said right at the beginning, there are a few precedents for this and the best practice is yet to emerge. So we may not be able to come out with a final answer, a, a perfect policy. Um, we may not be able to go out and go, hybrid is this. We may need to go out and figure it out and learn as we go and be open and honest with our people that we will adapt our policies and procedures throughout. And then my very final point before we open for questions, which is, if we're not going to do this now, then when? This is the moment for flexible working. Employees want it. Um, there are benefits to both the organisation to individuals and indeed wider society of more flexible forms of working around things like reducing the gender pay gap, reducing the, uh, the, the, the climate impacts of commuting. There are so many different reasons why we should be doing this right now. So my final thought before I stop my slides and um, come and have a little look at what people have been posting in the chat is simply this, if not now, when. Thank you very much for listening. Well, wow, fantastic. Uh, thanks, Gemma. Um, I, I've got about 100 things buzzing around in my head now. I think uh, what's on the on the surface of it, you might say hybrid working, and it, it seems like quite a straightforward concept, but clearly there's so many factors um, and implications as a result of it that there's an awful lot for us to unpack there. And as you, as you said yourself, it, it's uncharted territory that we're moving into. There isn't a an understood template that we all that we all know and understand. So uh, yeah, it's um, interesting times. Very much. So. Um, I'm going to um, run through uh, some of the questions that we've, asked. we've got. Quite a few. So just wanted to say that if uh, if you have asked a question and we don't manage to get onto it, um, then apologies apologies for that. But we'll do our best to fit in what we can with the time that we have. Um, I'll start with a really easy one. Uh, the most popular question seems to be, could you please remind us of the title of the book that you that you mentioned? I can, it's called Work Socks and How to Fix It, The Results Only Revolution um, by Callie Resler and Jodie Thompson. Excellent, thank you very much. And uh, they're gonna get a little bit more tricky now. Um, <laughs> this is a question from, from Laurie. Um, there seems to be some tension between how an employer might define which jobs uh, best suit home working, office working, hybrid working and, and staff in those roles. Um, and she says that she's personally considering looking at variations in, um, in contracts uh, for staff to address this. Do you have any, any comment on that? Um, I think it's, it's probably what I said after I, I think that question was posted, which is, is looking at it from this sort of category approach, because I think you know, it, 
there will be few organisations, I think, that will just go, um, everybody's 50-50 or um, everybody can work from home one day a week. I think with a lot of organisations, even small organisations, can be more complex than that. So I think one of the things to do is, is maybe like work consultatively with your people and come up with some categories. Um, Zurich came out with their categories last year. So uh, they're worth looking up. Um, and, and they've created, I think, four. Um, they're real leading in this space, Zurich Insurance. So they've got sort of, you know, 50-50, um, 100%. And I, and I think I would say work with your, um, uh, work with your staff um, to come up with your categories. And then you can almost do who, who fits where. I think whether you change their contracts of employment is 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 a question for each organisation. Um, if, if people are obviously at home all the time, they that would normally be their contractual place of work, and there are certain HO, HMRC implications to that, as many of you will know. Um, there's nothing to stop people still having the contractual location of their office, even if they're they're splitting their time. Um, one of, the, one of the challenges um, with this, of course, is that some employees will really want it in writing, they'll want that safety and security, they'll want to build childcare and things like that around it. Um, it is possible to do it in a completely informal way as well. Certainly at the beginning, because of all the complexities I've mentioned and the fact that this is still um, really emerging, I probably wouldn't change anybody's contract right now if I was to, to give my personal opinion. I would do these kind of things as a bit of a trial in the same way we would we might trial compressed hours or annualised hours because we've got to figure out what's going to work. Um, and there's so few case studies to, to, um, to point to. Great. Great. Thanks, Gemma. Um, and there's, there's a couple of questions. I'm kind of going to sort of group together a, a couple of questions here around. One of the questions was about... Um, what's your opinion on remote monitoring software, which I think you already addressed and sounds like you're quite anti that. But. I am. And, and you know, I, I'm also really so because I know there are some jobs where we, we need to have some sort of tracking in place. Um, but generally, my, my, my preference would be avoid it wherever you can. Because one, you can fiddle all of them. You know, if you've got that tracking and tells you how many times you're hitting your keyboard, I could literally be sitting watching Holmes under the hammer hitting my space bar. Um, you know, there is always a way to kind of get around this stuff. Um, but I think the other thing is as well, flexible working is built on trust. It's bedrock. And what we should be doing, in my opinion, is encouraging managers to trust. Let's look at the last year, right? People used to say to me a year ago, I can't let my people work from home because I won't know what they're doing and they might skive. I do not know, and I'm talking to HR people all the time, anybody dealing with a tsunami of skiving. It's just not happening. In fact, what most people are telling me is productivity has gone up and we're having to nag our people to take a break. I think the issue is more the other way. Yes, you will have the odd person and they should always be dealt with. But if you can avoid it, because when you've got employees have got control and autonomy, that is usually very closely correlated with good work life balance and well-being. When people have got low control and low trust, uh, it can often predict stress and anxiety. And autonomy is highly also linked to employee engagement um, and motivation. So, you know, the stuff around money motivates. We know that's also a great big myth. So if you can avoid it avoid it it's sending the wrong message lean into trust instead great thank you and uh, along a similar similar theme um this is a question from from jane here um what practical interventions would you recommend uh, for managers who want to move towards the um the results only work environment that you that you mentioned and and change that that culture Again, there's a spectrum with this stuff. So, you know, companies that have completely embraced remote working, um, you know, they exist and, and it, you know, there are organisations out there that have no office percent premises or anything like that. They never, it, the whole thing is done digitally. So I think there's, there's, to some extent, what managers need to do is, is lend to some of these other factors around what, um, where you are on that, on that spectrum. Um, and it's all very, very contextual. But I think, you know, it's about, um, working through what it means to you, working through what your personal um, preferences are around work, around what's going to work for your team. So, you know, one of the things I, I think I've touched on this already is um, making sure obviously people have got good objectives that are all linked in, all that usual best practice stuff that we talk about, um, and that you've got measures. So if objectives are, you know, measurable, time bound, all of those things, it helps us judge people more on results. Um, 
And there are other things that we can do, but I think it very much comes down to getting teams to craft this for themselves. So how are we going to introduce hybrid and involving everybody in that discussion and, and making it really clear that this is, it's the success of one person, the success of the team is a success of it for everybody and making it that joint um, operation. Right, brilliant, thank you. Um, and this one here is coming in from, from Nick, uh, which is I think more related to a recruitment angle is that assuming that going forward, um, there's gonna be a significant element of homeworking um, in many jobs. Um, what do you think will, how might this influence the criteria um, by which future employees will be selected? Um, I'm not. I'm not sure if we're there yet. I think um, what is important, and, and I, if I if I can put a, 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 a sort of undergraduate lens on that, I mean, I, I teach undergraduates at a university, um, and we're thinking about how do we build it into employability skills because we need to teach young people. You know, just because they've studied online for a year does not mean that um, we are going to. Um, uh, you know that they, they, they're automatically capable of doing that I think there's a whole skill thing we still need to build with our own people around how to be effective hybrid workers remote and flexible workers I could see there was a question in the chat and then um, as well and, and that includes things like switching off um, so I think we, we need to build the skills uh, I'm not sure I can see us yet necessarily having things like interview questions or selection around it um, specifically but you know I think testing testing you know if you are going to want people to work hybrid, you know, just things like people's levels of self-motivation, self-organisation, maybe, um, might, we might see that becoming more critical. I'm not quite sure we're there yet, but, you know, inevitably we start to test for the skills and competencies that we, that we need for our businesses. Yeah. Uh, just, just another thought on that, I guess, um, well-being perhaps comes into that as well, where certain different people are more comfortable or suited to working in isolation on their own behind a screen, others much less so. Yes, and, and there's actually some really act interesting academic theory behind this. So the, the, the research around work-life balance says that, again, you've got a spectrum. So on one end of the spectrum, you've got something called a separator, and at the other end of the spectrum, you've got something uh, uh, called an integrator. So this is around your level of comfort. So integrators, they're quite happy, you know, they're, they if, if you know, they check an email on holiday, that doesn't cause them stress. They are happy to work at any time of the day or night. They're not fussed if their kids are sitting next to them doing, doing their homeschool. They are very, very comfortable with that integration. Their biggest risk factor, by the way, is workaholism. For the separators, they're the people that for their mental health, um, uh, for their kind of stress levels, for their concentration focus, they need separation. They need that differentiation between work and home. We also have to recognize that for a lot of people, the commute itself provided a transition period. It provided a gap between work and home. People would listen to podcasts, read a book, put music on, chat, you know, even if they just did some more emails, we had a transition. We don't have that now. But if you are a separator, you have found this last year really, really quite challenging. And, and I think there's a couple of implications for this. One is if people don't want to be hybrid and they want to come back into the office, bloom and let them. <laughs> Um, I, I could see very briefly that I didn't catch the whole, but I just saw somebody say something about neurodiversity in the chat. We also know that for some people, offices, especially open plan offices, are a disaster. You know, they are distraction factories. And again, especially if you're, uh, you know, if, if you find things like that overwhelming. Um, so again, th there's an element of tailoring towards preference here. But for those people who, you know, need some help and support, we have to help people build healthy habits around digital well-being. Um, Again, this is an area I'm teaching my students about now because they have to know what, what is digital well-being? How do you manage notifications? How do you kind of cope with all of this stuff that's coming at you? Um, what does it do for your productivity, your focus and all of that sort of thing? I was talking to my students last week about things like, you know, screen addiction. And uh, I challenged them all to um, pick up their mobiles and see um, and have a look at how much time they'd spent on the screen today. I'm not going to give you anybody's answer. But again, these are all the skills that we need to bring. Zoom fatigue is a very, very real thing, um, which also comes back to my point around not everything needs to be a meeting. It never did in the old days. It certainly doesn't need to be a Zoom meeting. Uh, so reduce that cognitive load uh, is a really, really good idea. Brilliant, great, thank you. Um, uh, a question here from, from Jane. Uh, Jane's a member of a board and is saying that she would like to support managers um, 
to train them to manage in a hybrid working environment. Um, do you have any recommendations of courses or materials to really help us not. get there? There just aren't any yet. Um, I've literally just started writing my own um, for one of the organisations um, uh, that I do some work with. And um, like I said, this stuff just doesn't exist. If you, you know, if you said, I want to completely introduce remote, tons, tons of stuff. Um, but for hybrid, it just isn't there yet. So um, I'm literally um, starting to, to, to bring these things together um, right now. So it's going to be something I think we're going to need to develop for ourselves. One of the best things I can recommend, I think, uh, right now is, is try and get a network of other businesses that are similar to yours. Um, you know, I, um, I know we, I'm in sort of a university network that's looking at this. Um, lots of universities thinking, how does this work for us? because um, we're going to have to learn as we go. So networking with your peers. Right, thank you. Um, if I could I actually come to a question, I can just literally see if that's okay. Um, sure. And somebody said that they had seen some podcasts around the potential impact of homeworking on women. Um, and I, I think this is a very, very real issue. I was talking to an academic at the University of Kent the other day who does a lot of work in this space. So there's two issues here. One is um, during the pandemic, there is now lots of research um, about how women have uh, been more likely to be on furlough, have more likely to have lost their job globally, uh, and have been doing more domestic labour and more childcare um, during this time. So th there's been a disproportionate impact on women's careers. The playing field isn't level, and we do need to think that through as, as organisations to ensure that we don't take that legacy um, into, into years to come. Um, you know, again, if I think about academia specifically, you know, women are writing fewer papers right now and your, how many papers you write depends on whether you get promoted. So we need to kind of address those balances. One of the fears around hybrid working is, and I don't know how realistic this is, but that we could end up with women at home and men in the office. So if we think about traditionally women in, in the UK, particularly doing more of the school runs, more childcare, because of the gender pay gap, they're probably more likely to take um, part-time work after having a family. So we've got all these societal issues coming in. So the question arises, you know, if there's a day that everybody needs to go in, but it's not my usual day, um, that it's a day I normally work from home, can I go in? Or am I gonna have to say I can't because I'm on the school run? You know, if things move and change, a, a, a male worker's gonna be more likely than female workers to, to have the flex within their flex. I'm not sure I have the answer to that because the, the question did say like how can we address that and, and I'm not sure that, that we that we know the answer to that yet other than we're going to have to include these things in things like unconscious bias training uh, we are going to have to um, uh, think about um, how do we you know ensure that everybody is included and we, we bringing home workers into the conversation and that's where things like defaulting to online um, can really help and, and ensuring that when we are face to face we're still completely including everybody. Great thanks okay, and just off that as well you, you mentioned that um, the uh, sorry I've been classic example of uh, what remote working looks like my son's just completely distracted me by walking into the <laughs> office behind me um, so uh, yeah you mentioned about the the potential for bias um, I get, and I guess as managers even if we might very much be wanting to not have that kind of bias it's very difficult to perhaps avoid it do you have any practical suggestions around I know you said obviously like taking all meetings to all online whether people are in or not that sort of thing have you got any other suggestions or tips that we could implement to, to help avoid that I think it's really difficult because we're talking about again you know and I've used the term a lot but stuff that's really hardwired um about you know um and, and some of it's natural we just kind of default to the people that we chat to in the office so I think there's something in there about us having to challenge that and, and, and have it top of mind and, and be aware of its potential and therefore when we're aware of its potential we may be able to kind of acknowledge when it might be coming up in the moment the other thing for me is around um respecting people's flex days so if it is a question that we've agreed flex we then don't go oh do you know what well I want this meeting on a Friday so can you all come in even if it's your working from home day and things like that so so respecting people's personal situations um, and I think the other thing as well is tackling that language, tackling any of that stuff you hear around, you know, and it works both ways. Women get different comments to men. 
Um, but, you know, um, tackling any of that stuff when we see it come up that is, is really around, you know, underlying bias. Brilliant, thank you, thank you. Um, uh, another question here from one of our attendees um, who says they, they run um, a multi-arts venue, uh, theatre, cinema, exhibition spaces, etc. Um, and there's a, there's a clear separation um, in the, the mix of employees between public facing um, roles and uh, who have to be in the building and then the more office based roles um, who could work, work hybrid and be more remote and flexible. Um, there's concern there that it, the, it could create a, a, a division between those teams and a, a potentially an unhealthy staff relationship. Um, yeah, so any thoughts on how to tackle that? Yeah, and it's a question I'm being asked a lot at the moment, and I think it's a really, really valid concern. Um, there's no easy answer to it, to be honest, because, um, you know, you, you, you may well have these kind of mixed feelings between staff. You may even arise in conflict. The only real thing you can do is be very open and transparent and honest. So if you go down that sort of categories type route, being really clear to people about why their jobs can't be, um, hybrid or why they're in a particular category it's going to be obvious for some you know if you are a security guard or you know you've got to open a shop or at a certain time then then most people are going to have an understanding of why they're categorized like they are I think the only other thing you can do then is, is broaden back out to other forms of flex and say well look you can't have hybrid but we will welcome job shares or we will consider compressed hours and um, or potentially other forms of flex um, Wherever you can create autonomy is the only other advice I can give you. So, for example, I'm aware of an organisation that had a lot of people who, you know, for example, things like security guards, they were on like 12 hour on 12 hour off sort of shifts. They can't have flexi time. They can't have home working. But what they did was they said to them, you can have self rostering. So they went to those people and went, you're in a pod of six, you figure out when you're in, just do your hours or reduce your hours. Or, and, and they gave them as much choice as they could. That's really the only option. Right, thank you. Um, this, uh, this next question is more around uh, the topic of, of training, in, in particularly in the context of onboarding new, new staff. So um, thinking about onboarding new starters in a, in a hybrid environment, and particularly if, if those are senior leaders within an organisation that will need to be building strong rapport with their teams and within the organisation, do you have any yeah, I mean, again, you know, we've we've kind of muddled through onboarding people remotely, haven't we, in the last year? Um, I think there's a mix of things. A lot of the stuff that we would have held to be true before the pandemic is still very true. Helping people build relationships doesn't matter whether that's virtual, um, you know, whether that takes place virtually or on campus or, uh, sorry, you can tell me I work at university, uh, or, um, you know, on site, but trying to trying to give people a mix, trying to find a balance between when, when vaccines and viruses allow us, people spending time both in the office and out the office, um, making sure they know all of those team rules. So if you set up some team rules, this is the system we use, this is how we communicate, these are our core hours, making sure people know all of that stuff around the way we do things around here, that's really, really important. Um, and also making sure that people have got the kit that they need to work effectively immediately and access to all those channels. Because what you don't want is somebody, you know, while everything's been set up, can only really work effectively in the office or they can't access the, the Slack group or the Yammer chat or the whatever else. So making sure that text there, dealing with all the culture and the unwritten rules stuff. And then the things we would normally do, connecting people with the culture of the organisation, its mission, its vision, its values. I would have said that anyway, even in a non-COVID world and connecting people to people. Possibly more of a need than ever, I think, to give somebody a mentor or a buddy. So if you're just working from home when you go, I don't know how to access that, you haven't got to feel like you've got to contact your manager. You've just got like a bit of a bit of a virtual buddy. You can send an instant message to and say, how do I do this? I think that's more important. Right, thank you. Um, I think we're going to have to um, round up the questions there. We have we have answered the, the vast majority. So uh, hopefully, um, Everyone's got something to, to take away of value. I, th I think uh, what's quite clear, I think, with this topic is you could you could very easily have another ten webinars about all the subtopics within it. It's such a such a big a big and challenging area, but at the same time, I think actually quite quite an exciting one, which is which is genuinely changing the the face of how we how we work. Um, which uh, yes, it'd be fascinating to see how thing how things start to uh, pan out over the next year or two. 
you, you absolutely will. This is a really, really changing time. I am literally trying to blog and write about this myself as things occur to me. So do feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn because I usually post it there. Um, and um, yeah, we're figuring this out. And the way I would sum up is to say, you know, remote was forced upon us. It was an emergency. Um, let's see hybrid as an opportunity. Brilliant. Thank you. Well, um, I'm sure there's been I haven't managed to keep keep up with all of them, but there's been a huge number of, of comments in the chat just saying um, how, how useful the, the content has been. And it's been a, a val I think someone had said they've attended a number of our webinars and this this has been their, their most useful favourite one so far. So um, a big thank you uh, to you, Gemma, uh, for, for your time today you, um, and, for, and for answering our questions. Um, I'll, just before um, a roundup, just to remind you once again that uh, we have our next webinar is coming up on the 24th of March and that is on um, handling employee grievances and again that that will also have a little bit of a, an angle in it around in our context of remote working um, and hybrid working there are perhaps slightly different challenges um, around the whole area of grievances and how they might, what might arise and how we, how we handle those. So that'll be an interesting one to uh, get yourself onto. Um, uh, and uh, just a, a big thank you to everyone really for attending today. Um, hopefully, uh, as I said, you found it very useful and we look forward to seeing you uh, in the future. Thank you very much. <laughs>